Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I uh, very much like Boris's uh, humorous introduction style, but I don't think I can pull it off. So I'll introduce uh, Pablo more seriously. So uh, we're happy to have a talk by Pablo Soberon from our own group at Baruch College. I uh, constantly feel lucky to have uh, Pablo around. He's great. Um, his research is at the interaction between combinatorics and linear algebra and algebraic topology. Uh, in particular, last year, he had quite a big breakthrough with Florian Frick on settling a completely a variety of Verberg problems in higher dimensions. Um, in addition to research, Pablo is also very active in competitions and outreach in general. He has a gold medal at the IMO. He was the coach of the Mexican team. He gets our Putnam team to do surprisingly well. And he also gets students to publish surprisingly impressive results. Um, I hope that's enough. And now uh, let's hear from uh, Pablo. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming here today. So I'll talk about mass partition results and stiffel manifolds. I'll introduce what uh, both of these are. Let's start with this. So this is joint work in collaboration with uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, with uh, Ilani uh, Axel Rupfries, with Michael Manta, and with uh, Yuki Takahashi. And they are all undergraduate students that work with me on different projects. And somehow all those projects, they have a common topological backbone to them and presenting them together sort of uh, tells a bit more of a story than each of their own. So I first started working with Michael. And uh, this summer in our OEU, I worked with Ilani and Yuki. And somehow the, the projects were sufficiently close uh, together. So uh, let's start with some introduction to the problem. So let's start with what we mean by a mass partition problem, okay? And uh, so we'll start with say two measures in the plane. I'll usually have measures in Euclidean spaces. And what I'm looking for is ways of splitting the ambient space. So when I'm splitting measures, I'm really talking about splitting the whole space so here I would be, for example, splitting R2 into three convex pieces. And if I do it correctly, which I haven't done so far, uh, I would maybe hope to get each piece to have one third of uh, the red and one third of the orange. Maybe this piece has uh, too few orange. And uh, hopefully if I give you conditions on how you're going to split the space and I give you a few measures, you should be able to get a nice partition, okay? So the big, Underlying question, if, if I give you geometry constraints on how you're splitting or D, what can you say about how you can split family submeasures? Uh, this is a, a family of results that has been worked, I think, for a bit formally over 100 years, I would say. And it uh, so some common variants of this, or whether you're talking about continuous measures or discrete measures, it changes things a bit. If you're looking for convex partitions, so the pieces have to be convex, uh, that's a usual condition that you might find. If you're talking about polynomial partitions that has nice applications in, uh, in incidence problems, you might want to say something about each part in the partition. Maybe you want a special piece that satisfies something. So here, maybe I want a convex pentagon that has two thirds of each of the measures and I don't care about what happens outside. Uh, you also have, uh, say, algorithm results, which are prominent when you have discrete measures. If I give you endpoints and I want to find a certain partition, then the uh, complexity in terms of n is, is interesting. Or existence results, then you might get them in high dimensions and they often involve topology. So we'll talk about existence results here. All the measures I'll talk during this talk, you can think that they are smooth. They are absolutely continued with respect to the best measures. So I won't worry about strange measures in some sense. And, uh, and we're really interested in what is the topology behind those things. Last year, I wrote a survey with Edgardo Portan Pensado on, on this topic. And once you have a survey, then you have a bit file and it's easy to write a program that just checks the publication dates and plots them. So we went ahead and did this. And it's, I guess it's expected to be biased towards newer stuff. But if I'm not comparing it with anything else, I can say that this really shows that it's an active field of research that's growing and that it's exciting, okay? 
Uh, so let's start with the problems I'll talk about today. So the big message of the talk is that stifle manifolds, which I'll define in a while, are really useful to solve mass partition problems, and particularly to simplify the proof of existing results, uh, such as the central transversal theorem and, and things like this. So let's let's start with a bit of uh, ancient history and old examples, just to get some motivation for the things that we're going to do. So again, we start with two measures in the plane. Now the usual result here is that, or the, the first result you might hear about is that you can always find one line that splits both of them by half. And this works in high dimensions. This is what's known as the Hans Sandwich theorem. It was conjectured by Steinhaus and he proposed a proof by Banach, at least in dimension three. Uh, the formal proof of the version with measures is by Stone and Turkey from 1942. But if I give you measures in a d-dimensional space, then I should be able to have d of them simultaneously with the hyperplane. And we call them the Hans Sandwich theorem by the interpretation that each measure is an ingredient. You have two hungry guests, and you are able to just give half of each ingredient to both by doing a single cut of your sandwich, OK? So one nice corollary for this, at least in the plane, is that if I give you just one measure and I want to split it into four equal parts, then two lines are sufficient. And the way to see this is start with your measure, take a horizontal line that splits it by half. And then you say that the top is the ham and the bottom is the, is the bread. And then you just apply the ham sandwich theorem. So you get one line that splits both the top and the bottom uh, exactly by half, and you have this partition with two lines, okay? Now, if I look at the point of intersection I have here, which I'll call, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep a track of, of this point as we go into other results. This is a point that's in some sense very deep within the measure, because if I take any half plane that contains that point, it has to contain one of those four regions that I cut my measure into. And so it must have at least one fourth of one fourth of the total measure, regardless of which uh, half plane I take, as long as it contains that special point. So that's another color. If every half space contain a point, uh, so the, the point of intersection satisfies this property of being very deep within the measure. And of course, we can improve on this. The one fourth is not optimal. Now this is not a point that's given by those two lines, but it is less weightful in, in some sense. Every half plane that contains this point has at least one third of the measure, and now this is optimal. This is the, the center point theorem by Bradle from 1946, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, it works in high dimensions. If I go in dimension D, then I can guarantee one over D plus one of the total measure uh, for every half space that contains this particular center point, OK? So this is, this is nice. Uh, we know a few things in the plane. Let's just move one dimension up. And let's say one measure in dimension three, OK? So if I project this measure down onto a plane, then to this measure here, I can do exactly what we're doing before. I can find, for example, two lines that split them by split this by into four equal pieces. And when I take the inverse of the projection of these two lines, what I get is two planes that cut this measure into four equal parts. If instead of taking the two lines here uh, for the intersection uh, that split the measure into four equal parts, I take a center point of that measure, what we get is what we call a center line of this measure. It's a line so that any half space that contains it has one third of this total measure. Okay, So as I rotate, but still contain this line completely, I get one third of the measure. And, and this is sort of nice because with a center point, we would get one fourth of the total measure in dimension three. So with a center line, we get one third of the total measure. Okay. Now you might have thought, OK, this is nice and easy. It's a direct consequence of what we're doing. But we did have some degrees of freedom. One degree of freedom is, well, the plane I projected to, I could choose any plane to do this. So as you're doing 
this and you imagine that this plane you're rotating it and every time you find this two lines that cut the projected measure in half or the center point as you move it around you might expect to get something else maybe there is a particular direction where you can do a bit more than this and this was actually observed for both these cases so on the left side this is a result by Habiger, I think from 1960, uh, that if I give you two measures, you can do this simultaneously. So there is a direction in which you can, you can project and do this. And so for any two measures in dimension three, there are two planes that cut each of them into four equal pieces. Uh, what Habiger wanted to do was actually prove that for one measure, you can always cut it into eight equal pieces with three planes. And this actually implies it by the same argument I told you of the you find a plane that cuts it in half, you say one half is the ham, one half is the cheese, and then you find the two planes that cut both the ham and the cheese into four equal parts, and you have an equipartition into eight pieces. But let's say with just this one, uh, which is a bit no problem. And for the center line, that also holds for any two measures. This is a particular case of the central transversal theorem by Shivaljevic and Drechika from 1990, I think called independently as well by uh, of Vladimir Dolnikov and says, if I give you two measures in dimension three, there's a common center line for both of them. One thing to note here is if my two measures are the same measure, both of these results are completely true. Okay. So the first result I'll, I'll tell you about, and I'll prove in a while, is a combination of these two things. So this is a result uh, Michael Manta and I were able to combine. And it's the following. So if I give you two measures in dimension three, I can find two planes that split mu one into four equal pieces and such that the intersection of those two planes is a center line for the other one. And so it is a bit of a mix and match between the two previous ones, but this one, if mu one and mu two coincide, I haven't found a way to see that it's immediately trivial that for a measure you can find two planes that cut it into four equal pieces but the line of the intersection is a center line for that measure uh, the result we have is the cent the line of intersection has this property with one fourth of the measure but now it has this with one third of the total measure and uh, so and this is the sort of results that uh, we were able to get and and I want to tell you a bit about this and how they what is the not or what would be the natural extension of this to high dimensions? Okay. Now the other family of problems I want to tell you about is uh, regarding mass assignments. So if I give you three measures in the plane, you might be very unlucky, or it might be almost impossible to find a single line that cuts all of them by half. In this case, actually, if I cut two of them, I don't even get to cut the other one. And, and so it's always interesting to look for mass partition problems where you can where you can split more measures than the ham sandwich should tell you you're allowed to. And this is where the, the image at the introduction comes in, what we call mass assignments. So a mass assignment, say, of measures to planes in dimension three would be a way to continuously assign a measure to every plane on on space. So think of this black plane to be moving in space. Every time I look at its intersection with these two red lines, it gives me two points on the corresponding plane. Or if I look at its intersection with this sphere or with this green blob, it gives me a measure here or a measure here. Instead of looking for intersections, I could also look at projections of a particular measure onto the plane. But the main idea is as I am rotating and moving and translating this plane, I get measures in a two-dimensional space. And if I do this correctly, maybe I can find a line in this plane that has all three of them at the same time. This is something we would not usually be able to do in a, in a two-dimensional space, but since I have this degree of freedom, maybe I can get away with more. And so this is basically the a, a question that sorted by Patrick Schneider. He was looking for a result about splitting families of lines in dimension three. Uh, and so it, it, if you looked at it from, from the perspective of mass assignments, it, uh, 
it translates to this, okay? And so the definition, the formal definition here is, or the informal definition is that a k-dimensional mass assignment in RD is a way to impose continuously a measure on every k-dimensional affine subspace of RD, okay? And uh, what Patrick is this updating? I don't think it's okay. So if I give you many k-dimensional mass assignments, then there is a k-dimensional subspace where you can have all of them with a hyperplane in that space. And here the key number is if I am in or D, then I can get D k-dimensional mass assignments. So if D is much bigger than uh, than K, I can get as many mass assignments to be cut as possible. And this actually turns out to be optimal. Uh, I think Schneider didn't show a, an example of the optimality of this one, but Ilani and I uh, did show that this is actually okay. So this is the kind of things we're working with. If we're talking about K-dimensional mass assignments, then we can definitely uh, get more than what the Han Sandwich should tell us. So let's start with one example. So suppose I give you now mass assignments of different dimensions, okay? I'll give you three measures in R3. This is like a three-dimensional mass assignment in R3. I'll give you two two-dimensional mass assignments and I'll give you one one-dimensional mass assignment. So for every plane, I have two measures. For every line, I have one measure and I have three measures in the big space. Now, since I have three measures in the big space, I can use the hand sandwich theorem. So I can find a plane of dimension two, I'll call it S2, that has each of the measures by half. Now, each of the mass assignments of dimension two gives me a measure in this plane. So if I apply the hand sandwich inside this plane, what I get is one line, I'll call it S1, that cuts each of them by half. And then I have one measure in this line by the one-dimensional mass assignment, and I can, again, cut it exactly by half. So what I get is a flag of uh, subspaces, S0 containing S1 containing S2, so that each of them uh, cuts or has all the mass assignments in the next uh, subspace in the flag, okay? And this is when I gave you this many measures of each dimension. So what happens if I now permute those numbers? I give you now one measure in dimension three, two measures, two two-dimensional mass assignments, and one and three one-dimensional mass assignments. So S2 is easy to find. I mean, uh, S1, the line having the two-dimensional mass assignments is easy to find, but now we have three measures on this line. And that's much more than we usually are able to do. We did get some freedom here by reducing this number from three to one. So we should be able to have many options for S2. And the question is, is the freedom I gain by reducing the number of measures, does it translate to me being able to split more mass assignments on the final line? Uh, and the answer here is yes. Uh, this is what the big result we got, that if you give me a permutation of the numbers from D to K, and I give you this many measures, then pi D minus one, D minus one dimensional measures, and so on until PK, uh, K dimensional mass assignments. So this permutation tells me how many mass assignments I get of each dimension. Then we can get exactly the same thing as before. We can get a flag of soft places so that each of them has the next one or has all the mass assignments on the next substance. Uh, this is what we nicknamed the fairy bread sandwich theorem. And I had no idea what fairy bread was until Ilani told me. Uh, it, it is something that looks like this where you have sprinkles on, on bread or on whatever ingredients. And the idea is if I get to cut my initial ingredients by half, I care about how the sprinkles look in the cut so that I can do the next one and I can do the next one and I can do the next one. This uh, took me in a small rabbit hole of YouTube videos 
And I found out that people actually do this uh, for baking where they uh, make a bread where if you cut it, you might see something interesting in the cut. Uh, I think the most common thing is getting panda faces, but here I found this one which got this uh, nice painting by Van Gogh. So you would want to cut the bread into half so that you get something interesting in the cut, and maybe you can keep cutting and cutting and cutting so that at each dimension it uh, you get something meaningful. Okay. Okay. So those are the two big results I want to tell you about, and then uh, if we have time at the end, I'll tell you about the results with Yuki. Now I want to maybe give you some ideas about the proofs. Before that, uh, let's look at this permutation here. So the trivial permutation where you don't change anything, uh, that's the first example with ham sandwich, ham sandwich, ham sandwich, ham sandwich, and so on. In this one, we're cutting in each dimension one thing fewer than in the previous one, than the ham sandwich theorem should tell us we're allowed to. But the last one, we sort of make everything back up and we get this result, which if you remember, it is like this result that uh, Patrick Schneider put, that in the end, you can get D k-dimensional mass assignments, but you also get everything here uh, as before. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the proof methods and maybe link this to the, to the title of the talk, okay? So let's go back to our ham sandwich and see how we would prove the ham sandwich theorem. So there are a few ways of approaching this. The way I'll do this today is what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this measure mu one and this measure mu two, okay? And I'm going to take a sphere in the underlying space I'm taking here. Now, for every vector I tell, I give you in this uh, d minus one dimensional sphere, I can get a hyperplane perpendicular to V, which cuts the red measure by half, okay? So I just translate it until we cut it by half. I can assume that this is unique. If it's not unique, you take the hyperplane halfway through and so you can define it uh, continuous, okay? So as V is moving, this red line is also moving continuously. And what I'll do is I'll call this side A and this side B. So the, the side that V is pointing to is going to be A. And I'm going to construct a function. So I just have to check which side is getting more of mu one by taking this difference. So if this is positive, then I'm getting more, uh, more yellow on this on the side of A. If it's negative, I'm getting more yellow on the side of B. And if it's zero, then it's also half in B. And I do this for every other measure. So we get a function from a D minus one dimensional sphere to a D minus one dimensional real space. And of course, uh, it satisfies some very nice properties. So this is an odd function. F of minus V is minus F of V, just by noticing that when you take minus V, the only thing that changes is we swap the names A and B. And so the difference says they just change size. And fortunately for us, this is the content of the Borsukulam theorem that any odd function from this space to the real space uh, with dimension d minus one must have a zero. And that means we get a hyperplane cutting everything by that. Okay. This is related to, so if we want to do this in general, this is what we call the test map scheme. It's a very standard and uh, and useful way of approaching mass partition problems, we we're going to abstract a bit what we were doing in that proof. So you are given a mass partition problem. And what you do is you parameterize the space of partitions with a topological space X, a sphere in this case. Then you take another topological space Y, uh, which is going to help to tell you how you're splitting the measures, okay? In this case, it was our real space of D minus one dimension. So this induces a natural map from X to Y. If I give you a partition, you tell me how the measures are going to be split. And if you have a group of symmetries in the problem, so that like flipping the hyperplane, the sides of the hyperplane, for example, then this function turns out to be equivalent, meaning that if I do the action of G on X, what I get is the resulting action of G on, on Y. 
and and then you study the maps, the equivalent map from X to Y as a topological problem. And what you hope for is that the properties of this map translate to interesting results in mass partitions. In this case, the Borsukulam theorem is exactly what we needed. And, uh, uh, and it's uh, sort of what we wanted here, okay? So many times you are aiming for something you know that you want in here. So you know what kind of topological result you want, and then you work your way backwards to see what parameterization I would need to involve those spaces. Uh, uh, it's usually a very good way of approaching this problems. Or you go blindly, you get to a topological problem, and then you forget completely about geometry and try to see if you can prove that. So since we're changing our partitions uh, from being hyperplanes to being something more complicated, we need a different Borsukulam type theorem. And, and so what we're going to be using is Stifel manifolds in this case. So the Stifel manifold uh, in RD is just, so uh, with the parameter K here, VK of RD is just a set of orthonormal K tuples of vectors in dimension B. So they are all unit vectors and they are perpendicular to each other. I like to think of it uh, this way, say V2 of R3. And it's a rather nice case. So for K is equal to one, it's just a D minus one dimensional sphere. Still reminding us a bit of uh, what we just saw with Postoculum. And it's the computing the dimension of the space is also, if I want to do it in a bit of an ad hoc way, if I want to choose V1 first, I have a sphere of dimension D minus one to choose it from. Once I fix V1, V2, since it must be per perpendicular to V1, it has a, it lies in a sphere of one dimension lower. So I have this many options for V2. Once I chose these two, then V3 and V4 and so on. So this is the total dimension of the space, okay? For the sake of getting Borsukulam type results, I would say that Stifel manifolds are sort of in this awkward place where they are nice enough and geometric enough for you to get very positive things similar to the Borsukulam theorem, but you don't get them completely for free because they are not connected enough for the trivial or the, or the simplest arguments to hold. So many times when you want to take your space X parameterizing the space of partitions, you want it to be highly connected. That's a very convenient thing for us. And this one is not highly connected. So you have to maybe get something else to work in. Now, we needed an action of a group. In this case, our group is going to be Z2 to the K. So I like to think of Z2 as the set minus one, one with multiplication. And if I give you a set, a, a vector of plus ones and minus ones, and an element of my Stiefel manifold, you can just multiply them like this, coordinate by coordinate. And of course, what you get here is an element of the Stiefel manifold. So you have a very nice action of this group, and that's what we're going to be using. If you want something similar to this, but don't like Stiefel manifolds, uh, oh, and this action is free on this space, which is also good. Okay. If you want something similar to this, uh, you can take this other space, which I just constructed to have exactly the same dimension. So a direct product of real spaces of dimensions D minus one, D minus two up to D minus K. And you have a very similar group action of Z2 to the K. Whatever vector I get here, I just multiply the corresponding. So this is telling me which of these real spaces I'm going to flip the sign on. Okay. And with this ingredients, we do have a Borsukulam theorem. Uh, this is actually a fairly recent one, uh, which says that if I give you a continuous map from the Stiefel manifold to this big space, that's equivalent with uh, respect to Z2 to the K, then you must always have a zero. If you take K equal one, this is a sphere, and here we just have or d minus one, that's exactly for supply. And I'm not going to be proving this today. Uh, so there are a few ways of approaching this. One is, so the, the proof that Chan, Chen, Freak, and Hu uh, used it, they constructed a topological invariant, which was the sum of some degrees of some maps. And they proved that using this invariant, you could get, uh, you could get this conclusion. If you know about more advanced uh, topological techniques, such as the 
Fadel Hosseini Index. And you read the original paper by Fadel and Hosseini from 1988. They actually prove this. Uh, they, they show a proof for something slightly weaker than this, but the proof, if you write it for this space, uh, it holds uh, exactly as, as they were doing. So they were, instead of having different dimensions here, they all have those with d minus k in each of those. Uh, but their proof works exactly the same for this one. And with Michael Manta, we actually we know that we found out that we needed this result, so we proved it uh, with a homotopy argument, and then it turned out that it was already proven by Chen Chen Freak and Hall. But that's a proof where you wouldn't need that much topology. I think one of the simplest proofs of the theorem is, is by Ingrid Barra in 1980, where he does an argument over a cylinder. And that's exactly those ideas applied here. So there are a bunch of ways approaching this. And this is the big topological tool we'll take. Okay. Also, one thing I mentioned is that uh, my collaborators were all undergraduate students. And this result was actually from an OEU in Cornell where uh, Chan, Chen, and Hall were undergraduate students. Uh, so this gets it being a, a set of results which was mostly done by undergraduate students. Okay, so let's go ahead and show a proof of the fairy bread sandwich theorem minus a few details, okay? So the big result was the following. I give you a permutation that tells me how many I-dimensional mass assignments I have for each dimension from K to D. And I want to find this full flag of spaces where each of them uh, has all the measures on that next one, okay? And this is our big topological result. So we somehow want to take this and reduce it to a continuous map between the spaces. So first, a bit of, uh, of setup. What I'll do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to take away one mass assignment for each dimension. So I take away one measure, one D minus one dimensional mass assignment, one D minus two dimensional mass assignment up to, so I take this once and I put them away. And then I see how much I have left of each dimension. So that's going to be a permutation of, uh, of, of this numbers, okay? And so to construct my flag of soft spaces, I'm going to be using this stiffel manifold, which the number here I don't really care about too much. The important thing is that I have one for each of those numbers here, okay? So corresponding to each dimension I'm interested in, I'll have one vector. And let's do this with a drawing, okay? So let's do this with the example of, uh, of this permutation of zero, one, and two. And so if I give you an element here, so a triple V2, V1, V0, I want to construct a flag of soft spaces. So what I'll do is, uh, first I want to construct the two-dimensional space. So the two-dimensional space, I go to tau two, and that's one. Uh, so that's that tells me, okay, look at V1 and take a plane perpendicular to V1 until you cut the measure you set apart by half, okay? Then I go to the next dimension. So I want dimension one, I go to tau one, Oh, it's telling me that my internet is unstable. Uh, is it? I, I hear you completely fine. I don't see an issue. Okay. My computer is warning me that I'm, yeah. So I'll ignore my computer then. So I go for tau one and that gives me if, so V tau one is V2, I look at V2 and this is a direction contained in that plane because they were perpendicular and I just take a hyperplane in that plane orthogonal to V2 that cuts uh, the measure I have in S2 exactly by half. And I keep going. I look for tau zero, that's, so I look at V0, and then I take a point, so perpendicular to one that, I don't have many choices here, but I take now a point that splits the measure I have in here, okay? So I'm using the measures I set up a part, and the vectors I have here 
to get this flag of suspects. So now what I want is a way of telling if this is actually splitting all the other measures that I had. And so we're going to construct a map to here, which is just as in the proof of the Borsopulan theorem, telling me, am I splitting this by half or not? Because when I constructed this, I also have a positive side and a negative side of each of those source spaces, just given by the direction in which this blue vector is pointing, that's going to be the positive side of S2, the other is going to be the negative side. For this red vector, this is the positive side of S1, the negative side of X1, and so on for each of them. This is the positive side of S0, the negative side of S0. So this map is just going to tell me how much I have on each side of the spaces, and I'm going to arrange them so that it looks this way. You, you, you can't do it uh, directly. So for example, here, this is telling me the line should be split in two measures. And so I'm going to look at this line and see, so for the first entry, I'm going to say, say the measure, the first mass assignment evaluated here minus evaluated on this side and see that difference and do that for each of those. And I'll have exactly D minus one of the one half. And then I'll go to the next one and the next one and the next. So this permutation is just going to tell me how things are ordered here, but I get this exactly uh, as in the proof of the Borsukulan theorem. Now, I just have to check the equivariance here. What happens if I flip one of those vectors? The flag doesn't change. If you look at the process doing the flag, I'm always having the corresponding measure. So the flag doesn't change. We just change one of those labels. It becomes, it goes from the positive to the negative or the negative to the positive. And so everything stays the same, except if we flip a vector here, we're flipping the sign of the corresponding entry here, which is exactly the action I wanted. So it turns out that just by being careful, uh, this gives you exactly the a map of the type that was described in the previous slides. And so you know it must have a zero, and that means that you get this very bread sandwich partition. Okay. So Let's, let's see if we can apply this to get something a bit more interesting. I mentioned that Patrick Schneider had some hand sandwich type results for k-dimensional mass assignments. If I give you D of them, there's a k-dimensional subspace in which you can split the D measures in those. And since the favorite San, uh, sandwich theorem gives you a bit more, then maybe what you can do is exactly this, but imposing additional conditions on this k-dimensional uh, Softbits. So what we're able to do is, is the following. There is a, if I give you this many k-dimensional mass assignments in RD, there's a k-dimensional linear space of RD with k minus one fixed direction. So you only have one more direction to choose. So that in that one, you can have all the measures uh, that you were given. This was conjectured by Schneider. He could prove it with d minus k plus two in, in the number of mass assignments. And we basically get it all the way up to d, confirming the conjecture he had. And the proof is, well, we use the free bread sandwich with this permutation. So here, this is telling me we'll be able to split d mass assignments in the k-dimensional subspace. But here, we're able to do a bit more for some measures that we're not given. So we, we can choose whatever mass assignments we want for those things. And hopefully we can do them. We can choose them so that it translates to SK being K minus one vertical. So having this direction fits. So what do we choose for our K measures? We take one sphere center at the origin and one sphere center at each of the points we wanted to have as a direction. And so the first hyperplane has to go through all those points. And then we get to choose the next K plus one. Here we actually only want to choose K of them. And we can do it in a way that the next one also has to go through the origin and also has to have these directions. And so all the things we have here, we're all actually only using K of each 
uh, dimension, it just allows us to make sure that the end SK we have here satisfies the properties we wanted. Okay, now what else can we do here? But let's talk about central transversals back to the beginning of the talk and see how this is actually related to those things. So the, I told you about central lines in dimension three. In high dimensions, this is the definition of a lambda transversal. So I give you one measure and I give you a parameter lambda. And a lambda transversal is an affine lambda dimensional half, uh, uh, affine space so that every half space that contains L contains a lot of the measure. And the big result here is by Shivaljevich and Vrechika and also by Dolnikov that every lambda plus one finite measures in RD share a common lambda transversal. Uh, I really like this one because the number of transversals doesn't depend on D, just on the, on the dimension of the transversal. So the case lambda equals D minus one a D minus one transversal is just a halving hyperplane. So that's exactly the hand sandwich theorem. The case lambda equals zero is rather center point theorem uh, because we have just one measure and this is just telling me I have one over D plus one of the total measure, okay? So let me show you a different proof of, or a new proof of the central transversal theorem with these ideas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, this Stiefel manifold. And what I look is at the span of those uh, D minus lambda spaces. This is what I'm thinking as the orthogonal complement of what I want to be my central transversal, okay? So I'll take this span and every measure I have floating in space, I'm going to project it onto that space. Okay, so uh, I project every measure onto the space and I take a center point of that correspondence. So I will have one point in, in this plan for each of the measures. And you can see that I just want these things to coincide. If they all coincide, then the inverse of the projection is a lambda transversal for each of them. And so how do I get this to happen? Well, let's make a map from this space to what, uh, the topological theorem was telling me uh, we should be aiming for. And I'm going to do the following. So I'm going to think of this, the vectors I should get here as columns. And so I'll get my vectors x1 up to xd minus lambda. And remember, this was the basis of this span where each of these points was constructed. So I'll take this difference and I'll write it as a vector under this basis. So I write this vector as a roll vector here. P2 minus P lambda plus one, I write it here. Up to the last one, I write it here. So I have exactly the height I need to get each and each one of them this way. And then everything I have here, I'll just fill it with zeros. I don't really care what happens. There. So, since these vectors were orthogonal, when I wrote this vector in that basis, the entry that goes here in the i uh, column is just vi dot whatever vector I had here. And this makes the, uh, the properties of this map very apart because if I flip the sign of any of these vectors, their span stays the same. So the, the uh, the substance in which, into which I'm projecting doesn't change. And therefore the projections and the center points stay the same. So this part doesn't change. And so only this changes sign if that was the vector I changed. And that means I have exactly the action of Z to the group. So this is an equivariant function with the action I wanted. Meaning that for some choice of vectors here, I'll get zero on this side meaning that P1 is equal to P lambda plus one, P2 is equal to P lambda plus one up to P lambda. Th this is a proof that I really like because if you look at existing proofs of the central transversal theorem, they use much more advanced techniques. 
So you have to either compute uh, some characteristic classes in cohomology. You have to do something clever with the father Hussein index. You have to do a bit more work to get them to work. And, uh, and so in this case, since this topological result I claimed has simple proofs, this should be a require a bit less technique to get into something like this. Now, what if you don't want to be wasteful and, and you say, can I get something more interesting here? And you can also fill it with some other things. Uh, so we get the following result. Now I'll give you the following extension of the central control theorem. I give you D measures, okay? And my parameter lambda between zero and D. Now I'm going to get this flag of soft spaces so that each of them has dimension of the index they, they should have. So this is a lambda dimensional space, lambda plus one dimensional space, D minus one dimensional space. And S lambda is a central transversal for the first lambda plus one. Okay, just like in the transversal, central transversal. But for the bigger ones, S lambda plus one is a lambda plus one transversal to the next measure, new lambda plus two. The next one is a central transversal for the next measure. So each of the ones in front, they just deal with one measure, but we're not being wasteful. So we, we always keep D measures, okay? This is a, a variation that I hadn't seen written before, but if you know the central transverse theorem, you can bootstrap it to get this. However, in the proof I showed you, uh, I'm using very little properties about this point. So if, for example, take the case lambda equals, uh, lambda equals D minus two, so here I'm just taking V1 and V2. I'm projecting things onto a plane. If I project a measure onto a plane, instead of finding the center point, I could take that point we started with at the beginning of the top. So if I do that for one measure and for the other ones, I take the center point, what we get is the result, the following result uh, that's related to what we were discussing at the at the beginning of the talk. So I give you D measures in RD, and I'm going to find two hyperplanes so that they split the last measure into four equal parts, and their intersection is a central transversal for D minus two of them. We also get this additional condition here, which is sort of nice, but if you look at this property and this property, uh, ignore the second one. That was actually what I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk. And this one, I don't know how to get it with the other techniques that were used for the central service also. So this seems like using a bit more of the structure of the of the central service also, or the of this topological tool and the stiffer manifolds than what was being done before. Okay. Questions so far? Okay. Let's then extend this a bit. So I told you about central transversals. I told you about mass assignments. What if we want to combine them? So I'll give you a, a mass assignment, a, a few mass assignments. What we were doing before was trying to find a halving hyperplane here. What if here, instead of that, I want a central transversal? We should usually be able to get a central, a lambda transversal for lambda plus one measures. But if I'm with mass assignments, I may be able to get more. And this was done by Schneider. So he saw that if I'm dealing with k dimensional mass assignments in RD, this is the number of mass assignments for which you can find a k dimensional space in which they share a lambda transversal. And so you have the usual lambda plus one, that's from the old result. And this is the excess that you get here, T minus K. So the case K equals T is the usual central transversal theorem. The case lambda equals K minus one is a ham sandwich for mass assignments. 
the one that I told you that Schneider had proved. But this one I showed you how to improve with the Ferry Bread Sandwich theorem, right? Where you could fix a bunch of directions in your k dimensional space. So, can we actually get something like this? Uh, can we improve this result similar to how we improved the other one? And the answer is yes. So, we get exactly the same thing, just that the k dimensional space we get, we call it lambda vertical. It has lambda fixed directions uh, that we can impose on it. So it goes through the origin and it has lambda directions that, that we can impose. If lambda is k minus one, this is the result I told you about before. And the proof, I'll, I'll do it with one picture. It's a combination of the two proofs I mentioned before. Somehow you make a map where, uh, from a Stiefel manifold to the corresponding product of real spaces so that a bunch of them, they a bunch of the coordinates are going to be used to make sure that in whatever central transversal, in whatever k-dimensional subspace you're working on, the central transversal uh, is shared by those. So, and the rest of the coordinates which were not being used before, we're going to introduce some measures to get this lambda vertical thing as we were doing before. So I, I will be completing things here, just saying that you can actually combine those two things. If you expand things a bit more, you have enough information here to get the central transversals to be uh, coinciding as you want it. And you have enough things here to impose the geometric conditions on the space, okay? And I will just very quickly say one more application of these things. This is results with uh, with Yuki. But before, let's just go back to the plane. Two measures, one halving line. Three measures is usually bad news. But maybe if you twist your line, you can cut all of them by half. This is what we call a wedge, the intersection of two half planes. And the first result I know about of this type is by uh, Imre Baren and, and Jürgen Kamatoshek from 2001. If I give you three measures on the plane, there's a wedge that cuts all of them by half. So I, I, it was very surprising that this wasn't extended to high dimensions until very recently. And Schneider proved that if I give you d plus one finite measures in order, there's a wedge containing exactly half of each measure, meaning the intersection of two uh, half spaces. Okay. So it carries on that way. They both have to do some work to parameterize the space of wedges with a sphere and usable supplement theorem. Here is a very different proof. You take RD and you lift it to RD plus one with a wedge shape like this. So you take a hyperplane in RD and then you make a shape uh, like this. Okay, so everything here, you're lifting to this higher dimensional space. And whatever measure you have here, it lifts, we lift it to this higher dimensional space. So we have d plus one measures in that d plus one space. And we just find a hand sandwich cut of those ones. If I look at a hand sandwich cut here, it's going to cut this blue shape into something that projects down to a wedge. And that, that's basically a proof. Uh, we have to be a bit careful that the the plane we find in a higher dimension is not this one, and it's not this one. So we have to be a bit careful about what hyperplane we choose here, but it's very easy to show that that's not going to be a problem. So leave the measures, use the hand sandwich. Now, it basically means that if I take this direction of this hyperplane, I think I can get something that looks this way. And so then it's very tempting to just try to rotate this and see what I can get away with by starting to rotate this line in which I'm using as the base of my lift. Because this angle here, it goes from being the tiny one to being the big one. And there are two ways in which you can do that. One is it can become a straight line. Or the other one is that as I'm doing this uh, cut, um, 
getting this and this until I get parallel lines. And then it comes back from the other side without ever being a straight line. And getting this for lines is something I really want. Now, the problem here is that if I do this argument of lifting and using the hand sandwich, it's not unique, it's not continuous, it doesn't behave well. So you have to deconstruct the proof. So I won't go through the details of this uh, in the interest of time, but you can parameterize a bit of it with a stiffer manifold, parameterize the hyperplane you're taking in this high dimensional space with a sphere. And so the space you're taking is a direct product of those two things. And then if you look at what type of results you would need to prove the this thing about per lines, it's a per circulum type term, but now it's a product of a sphere and a stiffel manifold. Notice that this is what we had for this guy. And when we take maps from RD to from SD to RD, it's like the Borsuculum theorem. So it's a bit of like a combination of those two reasons. The proof again is not surprising, it's not new, it's exactly using the same techniques as Fadel and Cusini from the 80s or any of your favorite proofs of uh, the results involving Stiefel manifold I mentioned. And so you get this uh, result here. But for any D plus one measures in RD, there are two parallel hyperplanes so that the region between them contains exactly half of each. If I give you D plus two, I can no longer do this, but now I can find two concentric spheres so that the region between them has half of each other, which I really like because it was a New York based uh, OU and we got something that looks like a bagel. So we call it the bagel sandwich term. And, and the proof is, so the last argument is you lift to this paraboloid and it turns out that halving with parallel hyperplanes in the high dimensional space corresponds to halving with concentric spheres in the low dimensional space. And, uh, and that's as far as I wanted to go to. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pablo.